You're listening to the film podcast about indie filmmaking and big budget films with award winning filmmaker Craig Newland. And welcome to another episode of the film podcast. As we all know by now, there was an accidental fatal shooting on the Alec Baldwin produced film Rust, whereby the cinematographer Helena Hutchins was killed. And we thought it might be a good idea to do a podcast on potentially what has happened, what safety rules and regulations are in place to avoid this type of incident, and also what may follow. And we're going to be talking to three different guests. One is a director and two work in the safety area of guns. We start first with firearms safety coordinator Dave Brown, who is based in Canada. G'day there, Dave. Whereabouts in Canada are you? I'm actually in Winnipeg, Manitoba, right in the very heart of Canada. And can you tell us a little bit about your background in terms of being a firearm safety coordinator? I started my career uh, quite a few years ago as a professional firearms instructor. So I'd be teaching police, military, uh, government agencies how to handle firearms. And I was approached by people in the film industry and they said, would you come onto set and help these people look like real FBI agents? And I said, great. And that was almost 30 years ago. And uh, here I am still doing that job and still loving every day of it. And what are some of the shows that you've worked on? Probably the most recent show that might be available to stream where you are is a, an action movie called Nobody and starred Bob Odenkirk, who is better known in a television show here in North America as a Better Call Saul. And it was it was a really good production from the beginning. It was a very, very big action movie and lots of guns, lots of shooting. We used a, quite a wide variety of firearms overall. I would say we probably had somewhere around 100 And Dave, what I'd like you to break down for our audience is, if we've got an actor who is being stepped through a blocking situation, it's a rehearsal, the camera is not turning over, and he is aiming the gun at the camera in the rehearsal, can you break it down for our audience how that works? What happens when he gets that gun, how he gets that gun, how the gun is prepped, and the protocols around that sort of a situation? The first thing to understand is I'm on the set not to protect the safety of the cast and crew, but to make sure they know they're safe. So you can point an empty gun anywhere. It's just a harmless piece of metal or a piece of plastic or whatever it is as long as it it is, of course, empty. And that's the key point, is he's looking down the camera with the gun in his hand. The gun is going to be pointed, obviously, at the camera, which means it's obviously pointed at the camera crew. It's obviously pointed at the focus puller. Uh, It could potentially be pointed at the cinematographer if he or she happens to be lining up the shot themselves through the camera monitor. It could be the third camera assistant is going to be slating. So, You've got a a fair amount of people that at some point in there in in the next little while are going to be in front of a gun. So very first thing I do is my own personal safety check. uh, And I use what's called a a proved safety check in procedure. And that basically means uh, it's sort of the acronym, point it in a safe direction, remove all ammunition, observe the chamber, verify the feeding path, which is the path from the magazine into the chamber. And then I examine the bore for obstruction. So the very last step is take a cleaning rod, run it down the barrel, make sure there's absolutely nothing in there. That's my personal check. My next check is uh, I then take it to the set and I'm going to show the actor because this is the person who's going to be holding that firearm and they need to know that it's empty so that they can act and they can relax about their safety and the safety of that firearm and they can do their job as an actor. And we don't, we don't put surprises or anything else. We don't fire off gunshots when, and not tell the actors, you know, hoping that it's going to improve their acting. We expect their professionals and actors act, and that's what they do. So that's the next step. So I show the actor, if it's, say, a semi-automatic, I show them the magazine is empty. I show them the chamber is empty. Uh, if it's a revolver, I'll even go the extra step. So let's say it's a single-action revolver, Western-style I'll open the loading gate, I'll take the cylinder and I start turning the cylinder slowly so that that actor can see inside every single hole, the chamber where the cartridge would normally be. So there could be on the average revolver five or very likely six separate chambers. I don't require the actor to count, I just simply rotate all the way through 
complete revolutions and at least two and if not three revolutions. So once I've done that, then I invite the other people. And this is where anyone who's in front of that firearm are also going to come over and they will inspect exactly what the actors just inspected. So I'll do exactly the same thing for them. And I conclude that inspection with, again, another barrel check. I'll put a rod down the barrel. And then I'll invite anyone who would like and any person on that set, whether cast or crew, have the right to inspect that firearm. So routinely you would get the camera crew, people that are going to be actually having it pointed at them. Cinematographer, you may get director, you may get producer. So it's, it's basically whoever wants to see this firearm, come on over and you get to witness it as well. And then the very last thing I do, which is kind of interesting... Uh, is I close that loading gate, I take that revolver, and then I point it away from everybody, you know, usually down at the ground, and then I start bringing the hammer back and I click on every single chamber. And this is a routine practice, so if there's six chambers, I'll click eight times, and that is an absolute 100% proof that there is nothing in there, there's no possibility of that firearm ever going off. So it's not a matter of them just checking it visually, they can see for themselves that I could click that gun as many times as I wanted, and there is absolutely nothing that is going to be expelled out of that. And, you know, of course, it's slightly different procedure when we're loading with blanks, but the, the blanks are very rare. The vast majority of time those firearms are on set, they're empty and they have to be checked empty. So you're looking at a lot of eyes looking at that firearm being handled and safety checked multiple times. I go through that every single time. I also personally check it when the actor hands it back to me. So multiply, you're familiar with this, multiply two or three scenes by five or six setups per scene, by five or six takes per scene. And you're looking at a firearm that gets checked redundantly dozens of times. I think you bring up a really good point that I've only just thought of now. To do all of the safety correctly, it takes a lot of time in the schedule i can see whereby some productions may get a little bit sloppy in terms of trying to speed that process up is that ever a concern is that ever raised to you in terms of we need to get this cranking we need this to be faster we're taking too much time that's a really interesting question and i'll tell you the honest truth in 30 years in the film industry i have never ever been pushed for time. I work quickly, obviously, and you have to be working quickly. But at the same time, I also work safely. And I would never uh, hand over that gun to the actor, finish all my safety briefings until every person on that set is satisfied. Now, you know, normally what you'd happen is the first setup of the day, you'll get four or five people come in and they'll check it. Maybe the second setup. And after that, they're going, okay, we've seen it. We've witnessed it. We can see him pull the trigger from back here. Everything is fine. So it, it could be, it's not, it's not a very slow process and certainly not as slow as setting up the lights and everything else. At the same time, I've never been pushed. I've never uh, been rushed to the point where I felt that it was unsafe. So let's go to people in front of the gun. If these procedures are followed and the cinematographer, the camera operator, other people around that camera see what you are doing, witness what you are doing, they feel comfortable standing in front of the gun. Yes. And, you know, you you like to say we don't point firearms at people. It's always pointed to the side, and especially when we're shooting blanks, it's always what we call cheated to the side. But the reality is they're moving around. They're, okay, can you try this angle? Can you try that angle? we got to look at this. Firearms are pointed at people all the time. The crew is going to be in front of there, the focus puller, the camera operator. Sooner or later, someone is going to get in front of that gun. And that's why we make sure that not only is it safe, but they know they're safe. Can you tell our filmmaking audience Who actually should be passing the gun to the actor? Who is authorized to do that? The only person who would ever pass it to the actor and receive it back from the actor is the person in charge of supervising the firearms, which in my case, firearm safety coordinator, or sometimes called armorer, as I said, or key weapons handler. If it's a a very large film and there's multiple firearms and we have multiple people, 
Uh, we'll have weapons handlers working under the key weapons handler of the armor. The standard practice is that the person who handed you the firearm is exactly the same person that you give it back to. You don't give it back to uh, the other handler. You don't give it back to the person in charge of the safety coordinator if they weren't the ones who handed it to you. So on most films, it's one person, but it's always that firearm safety special. It's, it's never any other person. I don't hand it to anyone and they hand it to the actor. I personally hand it to the actor. And that basically gives a what, what I call a chain of responsibility. I am directly responsible for this firearm. You know who I am. I have a nice big name tag. I have a nice distinctive hat that if people can't remember where I am or what my name is, I, I just have this, this hat. I'm standing, you know, literally feet away from them, very, very close to them at all times. If the cameras are rolling, I'm just off camera. If we're inside, I'm never outside the room. I'm always in the same room. If, if they have to ask someone else to leave the room, to leave room for me, that so be it. I'm always right there. And then once the scene is finished, regardless of whether it's a rehearsal or whether it's an actual take, they hand it directly back to me. And, and that's it. It's only one person. Now, answer me this. The first AD, we know as filmmakers what the first AD's responsibility is for organising and running the set. Now, when the gun is passed to the actor and we're at that stage where we're getting ready, the first AD is then taking over running the set. You step back and the first AD gets on with their job, correct? I would never step back from the role, but yes, that, that's correct. The first AD is the person in charge of the set. They're actually technically the person I report to as well. And they're also, in most cases, and certainly here in North America, the first AD is also the number one person in charge of safety on the set because they are, they are what we call the below-the-line or crew, but they're the most senior of the below-the-line crew. So they are... Uh, in most cases, the person actually in charge of safety. And that's why, as I said earlier, when I'm doing a safety check and I'm showing the actor, the first AD is also very, very likely to want to witness that as well, because that's something they're in charge of. So I, I would simply, I, I don't step out of my role, but I step back. The firearm is now in the actor's hands, and now it's up to the first AD, and they're controlling the actor. And this is why I made the point earlier that, yes, we are going to be pointing firearms at the crew, simply because if you're trying to line up the shot, the first AD is going, okay, can you do this? Can you move this way? Can you move that way? Or the director, if they're working with actors, will be directing the actor, are you going to move this way? Are you move? So I, that's why I make sure that everyone on that set and that's even possibly going to be in front of that gun knows that it's completely empty. And Dave, tell me the procedure of when you are dealing with blanks, how that unfolds in terms of loading the gun and then handing it to actors. Uh, sure. When we're ready to shoot a blank, and, and I'll just explain a little bit exactly what a blank is. When we, when we say a live round, that means real cartridge, which is never allowed on set, of course. And that has a, a case, gunpowder, a primer, which is a little sparking cap, and then the, the projectile, which is called the bullet. So a blank is similar in that it has the case, it has the gunpowder, it has the primer, but there is no projectile. Now, something that a lot of people don't understand is blanks have more gunpowder than the actual cartridges. And the reason for that is you need the flash at the end of the barrel to sell it as a gunshot to the audience. So they literally stuff that case full of gunpowder, far more than the real one, because they need extra gunpowder burning in the air after it's left the barrel. And that's what gives it the big flash at the end of the barrel. And that's also why, by the way, that blanks are potentially dangerous at very close range. At an inch or two away, it could cause extremely serious injuries because you've got a lot of flame and pressure and everything else. So, so there's no projectile, but there's enough debris coming out that barrel at a few inches that it could seriously harm someone. But the, the hazard of the blank drops off very rapidly. Because that explosion is, is a bit of a cone shape, the dangerous range is very close, but they're very safe to use at farther ranges. Now, exactly what those ranges are is very dependent on the firearm, the power of the blank. And that's where having an expert firearm safety coordinator, such as myself, 
Uh, you absolutely need them on set because they're the people that know those dangerous ranges, know how far away to keep people. If the director says, I need this person shot at this distance, which is rare because usually the person getting shot is not even on on the camera. They're not on frame at the same time. But in the odd time, they, they want them close together. So I, I would know exactly how close together those people could be because I know exactly the performance of that blank. The other thing, too, is that the crew are also getting the blank fired in their direction. And this is where we're working with safety gear. So we're working with eye protection and hearing protection are the two key points. And in some cases at very close ranges, we'll even resort to shields and even a shield in front of the camera that'll shield the camera. And what we use for a shield is a material called polycarbonate. It's very expensive, far more expensive than plexiglass, but it is very, very strong and it'll provide good protection against the blast of a blank at literally contact distance, which without that shield could potentially be and has could be fatal. So the procedure with the blank uh, is the blank is not loaded into the firearm until the very last second. I wait for all of the other uh, crew to do their jobs, the hair, makeup, wardrobe, and then I'll wait for the third assistant camera to slate the camera. And once everyone is out of the way, in fact, I'll even wait until they're rolling sound. Uh, then the very last step is I load the firearm. I hand it to the actor. I'll always ask the actor. I'll say, are you ready? Just to give them that final, you know, no, I'm not ready. Or yes, I am ready. And then um, I'm ready. The gun's ready. The actor's ready. And then I will announce to the crew and over the walkie talkie, I'll say the gun is hot. And that's a sign to everyone that the blank is in the firearm, the actor's ready to go, everything's ready to go. So the very next thing they will hear is the director saying, action. And then we go into the scene. And joining us now is Derek Bort, a film director, producer, and writer. You might remember, Derek, we spoke to him a few months ago about his new Russell Crowe movie, Unhinged. G'day, Derek. Good to have you back. Oh, great to be here. Thank you for having me. I thought it was good to talk to you because you've done a couple of movies that have involved guns. As mentioned, the Russell Crowe movie Unhinged and also American Dreamer. So tell us a little bit about your experience from a film director's point of view. You're not an armorer, you're not a first AD, but from what you have observed on two of your films where guns have been used and the sort of protocols that you've observed while filming sure yeah well i guess you know for starters i am not a gun owner i'm not really a gun person so i definitely have a reverence for firearms in a way that uh a healthy respect for them so you know when when i have been in production and, and there's some kind of a gun or firearm on set every time i've used one the first ad has always led a safety meeting where the armorer has presented the weapon or weapons in a way that allowed the key people on set to inspect the weapon, ensure that there were no live rounds involved. The more eyes on it, the better. And the entire, the entire production has stopped, regardless of how inconvenient some people may think that that is. It's, it's definitely something that we've always done. And you're making sure that you get as many eyes on the weapon as possible and ensure that it's, that it's safe. And then once it's safe, it can be handed to whoever is going to be using it in a way that this person can trust that it's going to be okay to do what they're supposed to do in the scene. I mean, I think that that's really, look, the safety is the key, but you also, you know, as far as the person who's using it, you know, an actor is in a different headspace. You know, they're, they're preparing for a role. They're preparing for a scene, whether in character or, or just, you know, trying to get into whatever headspace they need to be in. And part of my job is to make sure that they're in a safe space, safe environment to not only go places within themselves that they need to go, but also that the set is safe. You know, there's, a, like I said, there's a protocol there that I've always seen followed and uh, pretty standard, I guess, you know, among an armorer and a first AD trying to, to run a set, you know, dealing with something potentially be dangerous, let's say. 
And that sort of leads to the question about the whole authenticity. When you consider that the film industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, which is incredibly, as you know, Derek, competitive, any edge a film can get to enhance the viewer experience, a producer will always consider what those options and the route that they could go down. So is that uh, sort of relevant, talking about that very question, authenticity? I've worked with squibs. I've worked with you know blood effects and muzzle effects and those kind of, and smoke effects and all those kind of things as well. And I just think there's such a variety of ways you can achieve the same thing. And and a lot of it's a function of budget and time. And take a path that gives you the kind of authenticity that you're looking for and is affordable and is safe. You know, it's a process of trying to figure out how to get that on authenticity in every aspect of filmmaking. It's not always easy. If you are a production company, you will engage someone to interface with a company that rents out guns. And there is a company called ISS. They supply their stock to all of the major film studios, including Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, etc. And joining us is ISS CEO Greg Bilson. Welcome to the Film Podcast, Greg. Thank you for having me. First off, can you explain this to me and to our filmmaker audience? The media have been calling the gun that killed Helena Hutchins a prop gun. Is that the correct description? No. Most of the time when a gun is used on a film set, unless it's a rubber gun or a replica gun that doesn't have to fire in any way, a prop gun is a rubber gun or a replica gun. We use real guns in television shows and feature films, depending on the mechanics that have been altered to fire blank ammunition. So when they say a prop gun, it's a real gun being used as a prop. So they're not really saying it correctly. And one of the reasons that productions use blanks to shoot is for the whole recoil aspect that the gun gives off. Again, it's one of those authenticity parts to using a real gun. So I'm surprised that there isn't a gun that's being developed that has some sort of a spring system that may not fire blanks, but offers an alternative to the whole recoil. No, actually, it's funny you would say that because many years ago, Steven Spielberg, in early production on Saving Private Ryan, wanted to create a gun that was safe, wouldn't jam, would continue firing, but would then also have the authenticity of a standard kick that a real firearm would give for the actors and actresses on camera. It was ultimately decided that this couldn't be accomplished for the hundreds of different types of guns you would have to do this for. And the reality of war, he ultimately determined, is that jams really happened in war. So we taught the actors and actresses how to clear around and do that as they would in a normal war environment. And so they just went with standard guns shooting standard blanks. So do you think now with what has happened with this death that perhaps somebody will design a gun with that? I guess it's some sort of a spring mechanism that can mimic the recoil? No, I I don't think that there's a need for it. As tragic as this accident is, it's incredibly rare for an accident like this to take place on a film set anywhere in the world. We shoot millions of rounds on an annual basis on thousands upon thousands of productions without issues. But protocols that have been established were not followed in this film in New Mexico. I don't want to get into specifics about this particular incident, but what tends to happen that you know about in terms of how guns are brought onto a set? Well, yes, I've been a property master in Local 44 for approximately 35 years. I have done armor work on a few different films. That being said, there are many people more qualified than myself, but the way we would do it on a film set is you always want proper dominion and control of any real firearms on a film set. Because of the logistics of some sets, you have to roll in a mobile cart that would accommodate these weapons. You would never leave a cart that was unlocked and available to anybody in an insecure manner, period, end of story. 
if you had to leave the set for some reason, everything would be secured into a lockable cart. You would let the AD know you were stepping away for a moment or have one of your other mates jump in and make sure that everything was safe and secure. And you would come back and then you would unlock everything and make sure everything was safe. Literally every time you hand a firearm to an actor or actress, you go through a set of protocols. You show them what it is you're giving to them. You show them that it's empty or you show them that there are two blanks that are in it for the two shots that he needs to fire in this scene. Every single element is gone through in great detail, and you never deviate from that. The AD, generally speaking, is the first safety officer on a film set. They're kind of the captain of the uh, football team, so to speak. So I would have a lot of communication with the AD, so I would let them know, and they could then broadcast on the radio if a gun is to go hot, it's ready to go, and we should all be ready for a bang that's going to go off. If a, cold, if a gun is cold and safe, I would let them know. If they yell cut on a scene and the actor or actress or scene was to have three shots go off and only two went off, I would go into the scene and make sure everything was safe and secure, and I would let the AD know that it was safe and secure once I've determined that. I don't know what took place on that film set, so I don't want to speculate as to why things happen the way they happen, but it is very strange as far as I am concerned for an assistant director to ever hand an actor a weapon in any capacity. Well, it certainly hasn't taken long for people to weigh in with their opinion. A Californian Senator, Dave Cortez, says that he's going to push a bill banning live ammunition on movie sets in the state of California. He says that there is an urgent need to address alarming work abuses and safety violations occurring on the set of theatrical productions, including unnecessary high-risk conditions such as the use of live firearms. So with somebody with your experience and background, what do you make of those comments? Well, with all due respect to our senator, I don't think he knows what takes place on a film set. He's attempting to legislatively fix something that took place in New Mexico. So there are already restrictions on live ammunition on film sets, safety bulletin one or two. It's never to occur. And it apparently, from what we understand, we don't know definitively, that's what took place here. If you were to ban all real guns on film sets in California, the only thing that will accomplish is all those TV shows and all those films will take place in another state. So you haven't fixed a problem. There isn't a problem to fix. We've had so few accidents in the film industry on a global scale. This is a tragic accident. This was 100% avoidable. But trying to fix something legislatively when we could have greater certification greater knowledge, so this doesn't happen on any film set in any state in any country ever again. Tell me what you think in terms of, in a normal situation, we don't have to be talking about this situation, but in a blocking situation and then squeezing the trigger in a, in a block, is that sort of, I guess, natural instinct, right, for the actor to do that? Well, yeah, it's a mechanical device, and the act of that mechanical device, how it operates is you pull the trigger and it goes bang. But if they're just lining a scene up for lighting purposes or camera focus or whatever they were doing, and the property master or armor couldn't physically be there, the normal protocol would you leave a completely inert replica or a rubber gun for them to line up on, and nothing could happen to anybody in that scenario. Why a gun was left with anybody unsupervised is the mystery, and I don't want to speculate as to what took place. I wasn't there. I'm simply indicating the way I would do things, the way most armors would do things in a similar situation. So let's just talk that through. What would you do in this normal situation of blocking where camera is not turning over? I would let the crew members that were physically there and the AD know that I'm leaving the set. The weapons are locked and secured. I'm leaving a rubber gun for the background artist or Mr. Baldwin to line up on, and I'll be back in a few moments. That's the way it would normally go down in a film set. Unfortunately, sometimes in our industry, because we've been around it our whole lives, you become a little complacent 
as to the complexities and sometimes the danger of some of what we do business with and what we deal with. But the reality is that a hammer, a ladder, a gun, anything if used improperly can lead to somebody being hurt on a film set and potentially killed. So we just can never be complacent about something that is potentially dangerous if used incorrectly. Hey, Greg, thank you so much for coming on to the film podcast and explaining it in the way that you have. I appreciate you guys wanting to cover the right way the vast majority of our industry does things on a regular basis. And it's unfortunate that we're speaking so much about props and weapons because of a tragic accident. When, as we're speaking right now, prop weapons are being used somewhere in the world safely and nobody's being hurt. This is an accident that cannot happen again. And as a company and as an industry leader, I will work to make sure we do our best to train and educate every film set, whether it's a $100 student film or a $200 million mega picture. Everybody has to approach safety the same way. And we're going to leave the last word to Dave Brown in Canada. Dave, where does the industry go from here? I can understand the the almost the sheer panic. I can understand why people are so upset. I can understand why some people are even calling for the banning of firearms off film sets. All I can do is point out these are our safety procedures. They've worked for 100 years. There's been 100,000 movies made with firearms where there was no incidents whatsoever. Firearms are different than stunts. They're different than special effects. I could do a big shootout scene. I could have guns going off all over the place. I could have a crowd of people that are all spectating. And at the end of the big shootout, everybody takes off their safety gear, walks away and gets on with their day. Nobody stands there and claps for us like they would for a stunt. And that's exactly the day I like because firearm safety is normal. Nothing ever goes wrong. Nothing has gone wrong in all of those years and all of those hundred thousands of movies that we've been making since the dawn of filmmaking. And then a couple of people do something really, really stupid. People are calling for the banning of firearms. And all I say is calm down. Firearms have their place. Our safety rules work Let's just keep on doing that. We can use a combination of fake and real firearms like we've always done. There's no reason to ban firearms completely off the film set. And the other thing is that are you willing to live with the results of that? Because in any kind of knee-jerk reaction, there's always unintended consequences. One of them being, uh, first of all, we need people that are experienced We need people that are trained, that are skilled in the handling of firearms. So as soon as we switch to all plastic guns, we've now gone backwards because now the producer can say, hey, I can save money. I don't need a firearm specialist. I don't need anyone with any kind of license or permits. I can hire uh, the cheapest props daily, and that person can now legally supervise all these plastic guns. So next thing you know, we've got someone who has no clue. The actor comes up and says, hey, um, how do I hold this? How do I make it look real? And you got someone who's only experienced with how to hold it or make it look real is what they saw in a movie last night. So we'd end up actually going backwards, not to mention the director is going to say, okay, in this scene, uh, FBI agent Turner is going to uh, duck in behind a pillar, pull her magazine out of her pistol, and she notes, oh, there's only one round left, and then she inserts it back into the pistol again. Guess what? Can't do that anymore. Fake guns don't work like that. They don't have magazines that work like that. You can't stick a dummy cartridge in, in the fake firearms magazines. You can't film down the barrel anymore because it would look like a pellet gun. There's so many things that you won't be able to do anymore. So to me, that's not the answer. The answer is let's continue to do exactly what we do. And that includes multiple checks done multiple times and observed by multiple people all day long. It's worked for us. So let's just keep on doing that.
Dave Brown, Firearms Safety Coordinator, thank you so much for coming on to the film podcast today and just giving us a little bit of a perspective into firearm safety and a bit of a breakdown on the do's and the don'ts, essentially, around what should happen on a film set. Thanks for your time. Well, thank you very much for your time. You've been listening to The Film Podcast with Craig Newland, your weekly podcast about all things behind the camera and in front of it. Until next time, have a great week.